today's objective is really to understand the foundations of how uh, human health ventures are started up, how to communicate to stakeholders and partners, including um, uh, help, helping you to develop your team, as well as sort of your business plan and uh, your compelling your compelling uh, business case to potential investors uh, as well. So uh, we'll go through the agenda, you know, why companies fail, what's your venture's compelling vision, you know, why you're doing this and who is it going to benefit? Uh, what is your, your business model? Um, one of the key things that we do in the lab to launch program is really go through how does the product actually get into the customer's hands? Is that really helps you understand um, the different points that you need to emphasize as you build your venture. Um, we'll look at you know how your value proposition is differentiated, the competitive landscape analysis, um, how big is the opportunity in market sizing. And I think one of the things that's very important about entrepreneurship UBC is that we will help ventures regardless as to the market opportunity. We're also looking at the impact opportunity. Um, but that being said, we do incorporate the relevant information into a target product profile and I'll go into sort of what that is. Uh, that's sort of an industry standard um, uh, presentation that really captures the the whole of your program and then you know what it takes to get out into the building and talk to stakeholders partners and customers and then finally building a, com uh, a credible and compelling uh, pitch pitch deck um, and and i think if there's anybody that's been through our program they can talk about how extensive the the training and the pain is to do that uh, and I can't see if there's any questions. So if uh, somebody from NMIN can let me know if there's any questions, I'd really appreciate it. Um, okay, so starting starting off, really, so building a deep tech startup, um, you know, many of you are working on some fantastic technologies and are thinking about filing patents, um, but this is not enough. So, you know, you, it, the, the important thing is to have a unique, novel, differentiated technology and with that, there's a number of steps that's going to be required to actually develop a viable company or a viable program. That's something we can go into later in the presentation. Um, okay. So CB Insights is a, a, a really interesting um, site in an organization that does uh, sort of venture capital startup information. It's a, it's a competitive database. Um, they do some really good uh, maps of, you know, different areas, which, you know, if you want to look at the CB Insights uh, website, they have some really good sort of maps of different therapeutic areas as well as different technologies. So um, the top reasons that startups fail um, is it all comes down to, you know, what's the, the viability of your company? They run out of cash um, is the, the key thing. And I think in this market, I, there's a number of companies sort of the, the, the ocean moves out and you're sort of left with not enough uh, capital to sustain all the companies that have been funded in the past few years. Um, no market need is really a function of not being differentiated, not being good enough for to um, be competitive in the market, um, getting outcompeted, flawed business model that happens quite a bit. Um, regulatory legal challenges, especially in the therapeutic side of thing that can happen quite frequently. Um, cost issues is a little bit less, um, not the right team. That's one of the things we think about uh, at Entrepreneurship UBC is focusing on what the, the current team is and what your future team needs to look like. Um, product mistimed, but really having a poor product is one of the, the least uh, likely culprits in terms of having your startup fail. Um, so what is your venture's compelling vision, why, and value proposition? So why are you doing this? You know, what, how is the, the world changed or is the therapeutic change or a patient change? Uh, how has that improved their life? The why, relatable, um, quantifiable problem you seek to address in your startup. Uh, and I'll give some examples from the lipid nanoparticle space uh, later in the um, in the presentation, but what is your value proposition? What is the actual value delivered to specific beneficiaries? The things you guys are working on is, are super cool scientifically, but how does that really translate into benefit um, for patients as well as payers? So, you know, what was the, what is the why? And this is an example from Al Nylum Pharmaceuticals. Um, and so ATTR am amyloidos amyloidosis. So before this product, there was a lot, there wasn't really any um, treatments that have been 
uh, approved in this in this space. So your tech, this technology from uh, uh, Amelin, I, mean, I believe some of it is also from uh, local lipid nanoparticle companies that have licensed sort of the delivery technology. Um, you know, here's a good description of what the disease is and how, how it causes problems. Um, and then they have a really nice graphic. And this is what happens when you've got millions of dollars to spend on your marketing budget. But you can steal these these ideas from these companies, um, you know, looking at the, you know, a compelling vision of the patient, what they what, what they're suffering from and sort of the, the market size all in one slide. So what is your solution? Uh, the Patisirin, and then they've got uh, backup uh, products called Vutriceren. Butris, it, pro it produces the wild type TTR in the liver, reduces the circulating TTR, um, prevents and clears amyloid deposits, and then halts or improve the disease. This is a really well done slide and really very understandable um, by sort of the lay audience, which is quite helpful. And they have a franchise, right? So really the, the, their technology is being improved, continuously improved. Um, so the first treatment's been approved and it's an IV administration once every three weeks. Um, and then the next version is gonna be a sub-Q uh, administration, which would improve patient compliance. Uh, the patient's gonna be able to do it at home. And then uh, they've got a, um, the, the third investigational product, which has a, an improvement in terms of dosing um, for once a year, which is a pretty pretty impressive uh, in terms of the the tech the, how the technology translates into benefit for the patient. Um, and so I plan on stealing this slide from some of my own uh, products, where you've got sort of a, a sense of what the patient opportunity looks like um, as new products get developed. Um, it's a really compelling and easy to understand graphics um, where you understand sort of the, the technology, how it's applied and how it improves and improves the patient uh, outcome and then therefore the market. So what is a value prop proposition? So, you know, what, what is the value that you're delivering to the patient? It's important in the therapeutic space, you're also providing uh, a benefit to the healthcare authorities, whether it's a more managed care system like Canada or a private uh, insurance um, system in the States or Europe, et cetera. So it's a value proposition, it's a relationship. So um, one of the things we spend a lot of time on in the lab to launch program is, you know, what is the value proposition for, for which beneficiary? And we'll do this based on, so for the patient, who needs to um, have a better treatment for ATTR, your technology is X and what it does. Um, and then we will also do this for a insurance beneficiary and the healthcare provider as well. Um, okay, so what's your ventures business model? So many of you are in the lipid nanoparticle space. So you're, there's a number of different potential business models some of you I know are working on differentiated drug delivery technologies where it's uh, differentiated compared to uh, other offerings in the market. So maybe you can um, deliver your lipid nanoparticle to different tissues or you've got better expression or it's targeted to a specific disease, et cetera. So um, will you be developing this all on your own or will you be partnering with a distributor? Um, many of you, I would assume, would be looking at partnering at some point um, for a product for a specific disorder, um, for a partner to commercialize and do the sort of later stage trials. Others may be have a platform technology that I mentioned, sort of a, a specific delivery subtype. So maybe you can deliver a specific type of molecules or you can deliver to a, to a tissue specifically. Um, and that would hopefully be a platform where you could partner a bit earlier and, and get some non-dilutive uh, financing into the company. So how does the product get into your customer's hands? This is super important because it really thinks about all the steps that are required to uh, get, get a drug from the lab into a patient's uh, body. 
Uh, so this is a product buy, buying uh, journey, just one example. Um, and it's a provider administrated outpatient drug. So uh, the the drug that I mentioned from Alnylam, basically the, the patient goes into the to the to the clinic and they they get an IV infusion every three weeks and then they go home. So but the you know the the manufacturer whether you ma you are manufacturing or using a group like Precision Nanosystems or other groups that are uh, really uh, amping up their manufacturing capacity, there's the shipment, there's the storage. Cold storage is important initially for the I guess for the COVID vaccines. Um, the uh, what's the pricing to get to the distributors? Who's paying for it? The third party payer, the health plan. Um, in 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 Canada, it's your provincial government, so you'd have to negotiate uh, with thirteen different um, uh, provincial healthcare authorities after you get your health Canada approval. Um, in in the states, it's more of a private payer, so you're you're negotiating with different um, providers, which would be like a Blue Cross, Blue Shield, etc., or uh, public public um, uh, medical systems such as Medicare. Um, and then you got to think about the copayment or coinsurance because there's a lot of data out there that shows that if you have a high copayment, then there's less uh, utilization of the therapy, and so therefore a smaller market. Um, yeah, so there's different contractual relationships. So it's very complex, and each product will have its own sort of unique pathway, and it's really important to think about that as early as, as you can as possible. And so. Um, for the folks that are in the lab's launch program, they we think about this quite a bit, and we uh, I think it's quite painful, but it's it's quite helpful in the end. Okay, competitive landscape analysis. So, um, so many of you are working in different therapeutic areas. So, what's the problem you're solving for your industry ecosystem? How is the problem uh, solved today, and what is the standard of care? And I think it's really important that we, I think I've seen a lot of companies that are in a specific uh, therapeutic modality, for example. So um, you would do your comparison only with other lipid nanoparticle companies or only other antibody companies or small molecule companies. The key thing is that um, in the environment that we're in today, any, any type of modality is possible. And you need to think about sort of where you fit within the ecosystem, whether it makes sense whether you, you've got a, a significant value proposition. So for example, with the Al Nylum program where you have the potential to dose once a year, that's something you would never be able to do with an antibody or with a, a small molecule. So there's the differentiation there. Um, cost is a differentiation, efficacy is a differentiation, but you need, you're gonna need to think about this for all the different modalities you're looking at. Um, you know, and some cancers, there's like 40 or 50 companies in the space. So it's really hard to do this, um, but it's important to keep on top of it and really have a, a good uh, way for your competitive uh, intelligence to look at the the different scientific meetings that are happening. What are the uh, key opinion leaders saying? What are the regulatory filings? Um, and as part of how I work with some of the ventures that we in the health space is really help them set this up and understand where to get the types of data. Um, so they would be looking at regulatory filings. You look at companies that have been through a recent uh, IPO or if they've gone public on the markets, they have some regulatory filings where you can find a lot about their technology, their markets, et cetera. Um, assessing how the products fail or solve the problem in some way. So that's something you can do from a secondary standpoint, like, you know, looking at papers, et cetera. But you also need to speak to physicians and potentially patients, depending on the nature of the disease, um, as there may be things where you think scientifically makes sense, but in terms of in the actual clinic, they don't, they don't care, or it may be something where you can find out that it's something they care about a lot. And it may be in a really important, uh, feature benefit for your for your product. Um, so, you know, understanding how your product benefits differentiate from the current gold standard, not only the efficacy, but um, one of the key things is being able to understand uh, if you're able to um, identify the patients that are going to be, they're going to benefit from your from your therapeutics. So that might be a, a companion diagnostic or other other mechanisms where you have sort of a 
uh, an understanding of who's going to benefit, there's a lot of different ways that your product can differentiate from the, the current gold standard. Um, and it's important to have a, a decent understanding of that from the beginning, but you'll have to update that as the product and the programs move along because the competitive landscape always changes, regulatory environment changes, um, and it can really impact what you're doing, both in a, ben both in a positive and a negative way. Um, so an example of a positive way, so for if many of you uh, have heard of Chinook Pharmaceuticals, there's a lot of more interest in sort of the kidney space, um, mostly due to the FDA changing its guidelines in terms of secondary endpoints. So that's an example where the FDA has changed how they look at a disease and trying to, they, they recognize that there's been sort of significant unmet need um, and there's a benefit um, to, you know, uh, looking at different criteria to get these drugs approved and on the market and improving the lives of patients. Uh, and so and when you're doing your market research, competitive land, landscape analysis, it's important to look at the different um, chemical modalities. So you guys are all, I'm hoping, in the oligonucleotides RNAi. Um, but some of you may be doing delivery of uh, different uh, therapeutics. So maybe you're improving the delivery of protein degraders or peptides. Um, there's, you know, but it's always important to think about, you know, what modality is going to make the most sense uh, for this disease. You know, what's been approved in this in this uh, disease in the past, um, and you know, what are what are the benefit the the patients current, currently experiencing? So, for example. If a patient currently gets a chemotherapeutic and they have a lot of bad outcomes, your modality may make a ton of sense, but will it? How what what will it take to get into sort of the first line therapy um, and into the patient's uh, patient's hands? So one of the the things that we do as part of Lab to Launch program is to really think about putting together a matrix. So what is your your benefit, your feature, um, and how does it compare to the other competitors? Um, I think, you know, a lot of times these are quite challenging to do. And I'd say a lot of the ventures that, that we work with, we have to coach them and, and tell them that, you know, essentially you're not perfect. And so, you know, what are what are the sort of uh, the, the, the traits or the characteristics of the drug, et cetera, the program that you're making? How is it not as good as some of the other um, other things. And so it's more of a sort of a sliding scale that we look at and really try to populate to understand um, how things are differentiated and how they, um, how you're going to be a benefit. And so, you know, you may not be the best product for a specific uh, patient subtype or, or a particular technology, but you need, have your niche and uh, that'll be, that'll help you to get on the market and get some market traction. Okay, so how big is the market opportunity and the market sizing? Uh, so how big is your initial market, the total addressable market? So this would be sort of an epidemi epidemiology. There's, uh, you know, 20 million patients that have a specific disease. Uh, the serviceable addressable market is the patients that are actually treated. And then beyond that, so let's say you are a specific line of therapy. How many of those patients are there? Um, and what are their sort of features? And then your initial, um, we like to call beachhead market where you, where your product is going to make the most sense. So it may be late line of therapy, um, or it can be a, if you have a, a companion diagnostic where you've got a, a, a unique uh, um, feature for a specific genetic treatment. So for example, in lung cancers, there are different genetic subtypes where your product is uh, potentially beneficial to these patients within that subtype. And so, you know, 20 years ago, there was just basically non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. And now there's like 12 to 14 different subtypes of, uh, of non-small cell lung cancer. And there's specific treatments uh, for each different type. And it, it really depends on the stage. So yeah, so Tam, every possible hospital worldwide bought, this is based on a uh, diagnostic that we have, that I took the slides out to put in more lipid nanoparticle um, specific examples. 
Where can you get re realistically get regulatory approval? That's super important. So, um, you know, if there's guidelines that you can get for the US, EU, um, Canada, Australia, Japan, and now China as well is, is a very important market. Um, where can you get the regulatory approval? And it's important to map out sort of how long this takes in each of these different jurisdictions. Um, so typically most people, most companies try to go for the US and the EU first, um, and then they'll also do Japan in parallel uh, and China in parallel. And so I think it's important to get you know specific examples. So share market, who's your initial, initial customer segment? So where will you get regulatory, regulatory approval first? Um, I think it's important to note that, you know, even if you can get regulatory approval in Canada first, it'll take you a lot longer to get the reimbursement. So typically most um, therapeutic companies will go towards the US first. Um, and so initial market, who are the first customers, who are the earliest adopters? Um, the example that I that I took out, and I apologize for not uh, taking out this slide, um, is for the MRIs, but for um, an initial market for a therapeutic, it's it's most likely, and I hate to say this, but these are sort of the, the patients that are the train wrecks that have failed all the, all other therapies. Um, and if you have a, a, an initial benefit in these patients, hopefully you can move up into uh, earlier patients that maybe may not have seen all the different treatments and may have a better potential outcome. Uh, and so, you know, looking at the 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 this is very important in terms of the patient population data. Um, this is an example based on Asia Renal Care from Harvard Business School, uh, understanding which patients are actually going to be able to uh, receive your treatment. So, you know, obviously huge populations in China and other jurisdictions around the world. Uh, there's a lot of people with end stage renal disease, but the patients that actually can access care is is a lot smaller, which is unfortunate, but that's sort of the reality and you need to understand that. Um, and so each, this is, uh, this is uh, end stage renal disease. So, you know, how many patients actually are gonna get um, treatment in a center and get dialysis? Um, how many visits they have? There's the revenue per patient. And so it's really important to dig deep and really understand sort of the market dynamics for each uh, indication that you're looking at. Um, and there's different ways to do that. So when um, I'm working with a, you know, an early stage company or for my own companies, I look at um, what companies have been in the space before. And if there's smaller companies, I look at their websites, I look at their investor materials. Sometimes they have R&D day presentations and you can find a lot about the market um, from them and, and, and borrow or steal as much information as you can from a free standpoint. And then as you get money in your company, there are uh, different databases that you can use to really understand, you know, how many patients are actually being seen by physicians and you do that using claims data. So a claim is every time you go to the doctor, um, there's a specific uh, billing codes that are used and that way you can understand really how many exactly how many more precisely how many patients there are out there and how many patients are getting each type of treatment. Um, and as we work with our companies in the human healthcare venture studio, we help to identify some of those uh, that information initially what's publicly available and then um, helping some of the later stage companies to put together um, uh, market research plans where they're actually accessing uh, claims data from different um, vendors and, and how to structure that and really understand you know your overall market. All right, uh, incorporating the relevant information into the target product profile. Um, so target product profiles uh, is something that came about in the, I guess, the late 80s. It's a FDA uh, tool in the States to try to help uh, stimulate drug development. It was, it was uh, developed uh, between the FDA and a number of uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. And so when you work in a larger pharmaceutical company or a biotech company, the target product profile is a key portion of your, of your program. So there's dedicated people who basically that's all they do is work on target product profiles for what they're doing. Um, it's a succinct view on the different product parameters based on in-depth analysis. It's really important that you get to incorporate the needs from the different stakeholders, especially from physicians, patients, and payers. 
um, but also from regulatory requirements and what you're able to actually measure is super important. Um, they're updated pe periodically um, within, in a big pharmaceutical company, they're updated, you know, anywhere from every quarter to every half year or year. Um, and they're major events. So they'll have, you'll have a meeting with, you know, 15 to 20 people. Each stakeholder will defend sort of what they've put into the target product profile um, and, uh, you know, what it means from the ultimate commercialization potential. Um, and it's really important for market indication prioritization. So, um, for example, the company that I've started, Mesotel Therapeutics, we're doing this currently for uh, a number of different indications within fibrosis, et cetera, and understanding, A, what the market looks like, uh, what the translatability is of the animal models. Um, and, you know, from that, we have sort of a, we have a, a nice uh, couple slides on each indication, then we can use that with investors or potential partners. Um, and it's, it's super helpful to prioritize inter, inter, internal resources. Um, and uh, it's, it's, some, it's a good skill to have. And it's, it's, uh, I find it quite fun, actually. So. Um, so getting out of the building and talking to stakeholders, partners, and customers. So when you're actually developing uh, a company pitch deck, et cetera. So is your secondary research enough? What is your venture's compelling vision, uh, mission, why, and the value proposition? Uh, that's super important. So, you know, why should somebody invest in you? You know, what is, you know, why, why would a patient be interested in your therapy? Um, Definitely having an understanding of your venture's business model. Um, one of the, the fun things as being part of Entrepreneurship UBC is that we get tons of different business models and we can see, you know, what, what are the comparable uh, visions for these type of companies and, and what works for them? Um, how does the product get into your customer's hands? Um, really helping with the competitive landscape analysis. And that's something that is, is a skill, but it's also an art. Um, how big is the market opportunity, market sizing, the translatability. Um, and then we typically put the, all of that together in a target product profile. And I don't, I can't see who's on the call right now, but I think there's uh, a couple groups um, that are in your network, such as Saragene, where we've done this initial work with the target product profile. Ah, so secondary research isn't enough. You need to get out of the building and talk to people. So. Um, one of the things that is amazing is if you're a student, people will typically talk to you. You can reach out to key opinion leaders, and at least some of them will get back to you and not charge you anything. Um, it's also important to talk to uh, folks that have been in, in sort of this business in the past. Ideally, you find somebody that's um, been in this type of venture and who's had an exit. So they've either sold their company or the company has gone public and they've retired or, or left. Um, understanding, you know, what are sort of the caveats, what, what, what are their learnings, um, speak to distributors, speak to uh, patient advocacy groups, um, and then, you know, really that'll help you with your value proposition. So I'll tell you, in my case, for, for Mesentel and for other companies I've worked with, we have been out and about talking to uh, um, different organizations. Uh, mostly in the the angel investors and the VC groups, understanding what how is our value uh, proposition differentiated, uh, and what will they need to see to actually believe in in what we think is our value proposition. That's the most important thing, actually, is how to make your story actually believable. What data is required? Is it something you can do um, within the academic side of things, or is it something that you're going to have to raise tons of money to order and get into the clinic? Um, and we put all of that in again into the target product profile. Okay, uh, last part of the agenda building a compelling, incredible pitch. So, um, and so we do a lot of uh pitch training, and it starts from the very beginning of the lab to launch program. Um, you know, we ask the ventures to give a succinct, um, uh, overview of their technology and their mission and what they're trying to do. Um, and there's, it's amazing the transition from a, a company or a venture that's in sort of the first week of the uh, venture founder program compared to the last where we have sort of a, a big event. Um, they've been through pitch training. They've been 
uh, spend tons of time working on their value proposition, understanding uh, all of the, the key components of the therapeutic or the, the technology that they're developing, uh, the market sizing, et cetera. Um, so uh, leadership is important. So what is your background? Why, why should somebody invest in you? Um, it's important to note that, you know, essentially when you're, you know, seeking funding, how your leadership is going to change over time. So one of the things that we do is look at um, comparable companies and then see, you know, what, what was the evolution of these companies, both on the funding side, the technology side, as well as the people side. I think that's, a, that's something that, that some people sometimes miss is understanding, you know, what is going to be required to really move your company forward. Um, as uh, you know, so if you want to be a scientific founder, say you're a professor in a lab, um, what is your role in the beginning and how does that change over time? Do you want to stay in your academic academic role or are you looking to jump fully into the company? Uh, for those of you who are sort of postdocs or working in a lab, um, what does that look like and what, what are the, the key things you need to do? Um, and there's also some great leadership courses that are available. Uh, Admari has a, a great leadership program. Um, if you're fortunate to be selected for that, that could help you sort of um, articulate what that looks like. Um, and then so moving on to three, the compelling problem to be solved. What is the, the key thing that you're trying to solve and, and how is your product differentiated? What's your product and solution? Why is it, why is it competitive? Um, and um, why is it, uh, why is it going to be a better solution? So competition and substitutes. Um, Unfortunately, the, the substitutes is a major issue for uh, groups in, in Vancouver, such as QLT Therapeutics. Um, so when I joined uh, QLT in 2005, uh, they had a product called Visudine, which was used for macular degeneration. Um, but there was a, a group, there's a physician that actually used a, uh, a cancer antibody um, called Avastin, which was basically $50 a shot compared to our our solution, um, which was much better treatment for the patients that we were, we were serving. And so when I started at QLT, there were about 500 people in, in the company. When I left, there was like 30. Um, and so substitutes are super important. So I see somebody's in the chat. Let me see here. Oh, hi, Terry Allen. <laughs> Love to hear your question when we get to it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I haven't talked to you, Terry, in so long. How are you? Good to see your good to see your name and hear your voice. Yeah, doing good. I'm sorry I was late, but I tried to get in, and there was some kind of a technical problem. Got it. Um, okay, so understanding your market size and the go-to-market strategy super important. And what's really important in, in terms of your mark go-to-market strategy is how you're designing your clinical trials. So uh, there's there's sort of a um, something called a new product planning where you work with clinicians, uh, market specialists, et cetera, to understand uh, what, what clinical trial is going to give you the data that's going to support your, your product labeling. And so that is very important. It's something that small biotechs can often get wrong. Um, uh, your business model. So I have a, and I'm happy to share like my pitch deck. I have a, a business model where we have sort of three different pillars for Mesentel which is A, we develop products on our own, B, we partner at specific inflection points, and C, we're open to doing um, sort of platform partnerships um, it, in, in areas which are not our, um, our core therapeutic focus. Uh, and it's important to have sort of a, and, and test, test that. So, you know, give your presentation, get feedback and, and change it accordingly. Um, as you get more advanced, it's really important to understand the insurance and reimbursement strategy. So how are your, how are products in your field currently reimbursed? Um, and it's more important in the States than pretty much anywhere else. So um, there are so many quirks with the US medical system in terms of, is it a pill? Is it, a, is it injection? Do you have to go to your, your, your doctor to get uh, an IV in, infusion? Or is it something you can take at home? Does it need to be delivered by a specialty pharmaceutical uh, group? Does that have to be stored cold? All of this is super important. Um, and it's something that, that we focus a lot in the, the lab to launch program, but it's, it's also very important as you move forward outside of that and into different accelerators. Um, what is your product development regulatory strategy? So I would say one of the key things that is missing 
from the ventures that we work with is an understanding of sort of the regulatory side of things, whether it's a medical device or whether it's the uh, therapeutic. Um, that's something that's it's a key thing that's missing is really understanding what that looks like, sort of the quality that's required for a medical device or the uh, for a regulatory strategy, like what are the things you need to do to get your program into the clinic? So looking at sort of non-clinical studies, the toxicology studies, the efficacy studies, um, and the costs that go along with that uh, when you're putting together your budget. Uh, intellectual property strategy is super important. And one thing that's come up uh, recently is the IRAP um, IP assist program. I would urge you all to look into that. Um, I don't know if anybody from IRAP is on the call, but it's a it's a great way to have a sort of initial call and get a, a, a look at um, what is your IP strategy. And then as you uh, raise funds, you can use that money effectively to put together a very comprehensive IP strategy. Um, and I know that the that the lipid nanoparticle IP landscape is quite complex. And I know that we have engaged uh, IP. Um, so Sean Lum, our uh, managing director at EUBC, has, has actually actually knows people who are well versed in sort of the IP strategy for lipid nanoparticles. So it's important to not only get sort of a, a cursory view from groups like IRAP, but it's also very important to get folks that really understand the IP uh, history as well as the landscape of the area that you're looking in. Um, financial requirements and use of proceeds, so putting together a comprehensive budget and where what inflection points that gets to you, that's something that's quite challenging and, and uh, very important and, and really important in terms of how you uh, present that to um, angel investors as well as uh, venture capital funds. Um, and that's something that's, I, I would say, definitely get feedback from uh, folks in the ecosystem that, that can that understand your field and make sure that you're doing that as, as best as possible and as granular as possible. Um, in your pitch deck, it's typically high level, but when they when a, an investor needs to see what that looks like, you need a very detailed Gantt chart. Um, and it's also good to have comparators, right? So one of the things that I do is when I'm looking at a new therapeutic area, as I look at um, uh, I, uh, um, I, S1 filings, which is, a regulatory document that companies that go to uh, file there for uh, to go public on the market, they'll tell you how much they spend on a program over the years. So you can have a, a sense of a how long it took this program to get to market and b how much it cost. Um, and it can vary widely depending on the company. So one of the examples that I'm looking at right now is is in sarcomas where um, one company got their program to onto the market for about 15 million. Um, and it took them very little time. Another company spent over hundred million and, uh, and we're not sure why, but it, it shows you sort of the heterogeneity of, of uh, you know, how companies spend their money um, and really trying to understand, you know, for, for your investors, what that means. Uh, and then finally you have a summary, you know, what, what is the benefit of your company? What's the technology benefit, your team benefit, um, what you're looking to achieve and where the money will take you. Um, and so, oh, that's it. So I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Jonathan, can you hear me? I can. So recently we had an admin meeting and we were discussing about the uh, legacy of the admin and how we, how we would go forward. And one of the compelling cases for our particular technologies for delivering gene medicines, et cetera, involves rare diseases where, where there's uh, relatively few patients. Indeed, we have one application where the patient number is an N of one presently. And, and, and so I was questioning at that time, what kind of business model is there for dealing with uh, diseases where there's a compelling need and where there the technology exists or can be easily readily adapted but there's not an opportunity to really make much of a profit right uh so that's a that's a great question terry so um there was the orphan drug act which was enacted in the 80s 
So that is something that's really helped develop, sort of stimulate the development of therapeutics for rare disorders where there's significant un, unmet need. Um, and there's, there's actual companies that sort of specialize, that's their business model, to look at developing uh, therapeutics for rare disorders. So there's a company called Helix uh, in the UK, there's um, Biomarin. Many of these companies are sort of founded on the potential to do, to develop treatments for rare disorders. Um, I would say that, you know, N of one is quite challenging, but uh, that might be something where you need to engage a patient advocacy group um, or I don't know how you're going to fund that, but uh, I would say that there are a number of different disorders where the N is more like a thousand, where you can develop this, those <laughs> drugs, um, you know, using a deep understanding of the biology um, and where that fits in terms of your, your treatment. Uh, and I know companies like Seragene are looking at rare disorders or some, some rare disorders, some bigger mm -hmm. disorders. Um, and sort of the orphan drug designation uh, is something that you apply for both in the States, the EU and Japan, and that gives you market exclusivity. And that's something that's beneficial. Um, but, you know, orphan drugs are a huge, uh, they make, they can make tons of money because you can charge pretty high prices um, and you have very uh, high margins. Um, but I guess it's a case by case example. So, um, there's certainly a lot more opportunities for rare disorders. And I've done actually presentations on Orphan Drug Act a long time ago when I was at QLT. And I don't think, I think, you know, in terms of things that have changed, um, the biggest thing that's changed is that big pharma is interested in these things now. So, you know, a small company will develop a therapeutic for a rare disorder um, and get it onto the market or get it close to market. And then big companies will swoop in and buy it up. Um, in the LNP space, there's a number of different companies, Alnylam, for example, ATTR is a rare disorder. Um, so in rare meaning less than 200 in the States. Um, and the ultra orphan disorder, there's a number of different business models on that side as well. So, um, I, you know, it, it's a case by case example, but there's definitely opportunities and it's really, it's really an opportunity to help patients. Um, your technology allows that and, you know, it's, I think it's much more amenable to you know rare orphan disorders than some of the other modalities. So, yeah, okay. thanks a lot. Do you recall what the actual numbers are for the orphan disease uh, uh, program in the U.S.? I, I when I looked at it, I thought it was actually quite high relative to some of the diseases we might be interested in. Right. Uh, yeah. So in the U.S., it's it's uh, two hundred thousand or less is potentially that, that's high yep it is um and then there's also something so there's also other regulatory things you might want to think about terry so there's the pediatric designation so if it's a if it's a rare disorder in kids there's something you can get as a pediatric voucher um but you you can only get that if it's approved in the pediatric population but that's something that um it's at a high level it basically it's a voucher that'll allow you to get any program um, evaluated by the FDA six months earlier than a normal program. And you could sell that voucher to uh, big pharma and they'll buy them for hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and there's also breakthrough designation too. So if you have a therapeutic, um, which is uh, solving a significant unmet need for a rare or um, you know, a pretty significant disorder, um, that will give you benefits in terms of exclusivity and speed and access. Um, and it also helps you with investors, right? So um, that's important. There's a number of different regulatory um, benefit opportunities to look at. So it depends on each situation. That's something we have a high level view on and we can share that with uh, anybody that's interested in terms of you know, their specific program. Great. Thanks so much, Terry, for the question. And thank you, Jonathan, for the detailed response. Marshall, do we have any other questions? Yes, we have two written questions that have been submitted, which I can read out now. The first of which goes as follows. If it costs $15 million to bring a single therapeutic to market, how can startups possibly afford this? What would be a viable commercialization pathway for a lab to launch startup? Excellent question. 
Um, and so 15 million to bring a therapeutic to market is actually quite low. This is not typical. So that um, typically it takes anywhere from, you know, a couple hundred million to billions to get a, a product to market. It's really dependent on um, the size of the patient population, the size of the clinical trials. Um, and so there's a couple different ways that you could bring a therapeutic to market as a small company. A, you could, you could license it to a, a big company after, let's say you spend five to 10 million uh, to get it into the clinic and it shows a bit of efficacy, then the a big pharma or a, even a biotech would take it over and, and you, you know, get the, the licensing. And secondarily, you have to raise a lot of money. Um, so, you know, companies such as, you know, there's, we've got great examples in town, you know, Xenon, <laughs> Abcellera, Zymeworks, all these companies started out as quite small. They, and as their technology um, was translated, um, they actually um, raised money, both they can get uh, license fees, but they've raised money and they've gotten programs in the clinic. So um, Zymeworks, for example, has probably raised about 500 million or so, maybe more, maybe less. Uh, to get their HER2 biparatopic antibody into the clinic. Uh, Xenon's got a number of different programs uh, for, and this is another example of a rare disorder. They've got a rare um, uh, neurological disorders that they're treating. They've raised hundreds of millions as well. Um, anyhow, so there's different ways you can do it, but the, the ultimate thing is it's gonna be dependent on, on your technology and sort of looking at that business model. But good question. During the presentation for the investors, do you think a major chunk of time should be spent on the technology product solution part of the presentation or on the business model finances part of it? Excellent question. Uh, and so it really depends on the investor you're speaking to. So um, for example, in Mesentel, we have very detailed scientific decks and that's for uh, venture capitalists who have a more scientific bend. But then we also have uh, more general, um, and and so for example, let's let's give the example of sarcomas. Like so, we'll talk about for an angel investor or an investor that's not um, very uh, on the science side; they're more on the business side. We'll talk about the compelling opportunity to save kids' lives. You know the impact the disease has on them, etc. But for a, a more scientific uh, presentation, we'll have sort of wire technology works. Uh, how it's differentiated, uh, and then we'll do a bit on the, the business side of things. So it, it's really depending on who you're speaking to, but it's important to have an understanding of both. And it's important to um, being able to sort of do uh, sort of a, a dumbed down version, for lack of a better word, for general audiences, pitches where you're, you know, giving a 90 second presentation really you need sort of a, a, a heart, uh, something that, you know, the pulling the heart strings and, and getting them interested in what you're doing versus the, I've got the best uh, solution for this disease and here's why. So, um, and we spend a lot of time looking at the pitch decks. We've got a lot of examples that we use for EUBC. Um, and we look at the smaller companies. We look at the big pharma companies. We look at their R&D days. We look at their, their investor presentations. And that really helps to um help you sort of craft your story for both for both audiences thank you jonathan and thank you wabashek for the question so jonathan i'm going to ask you to go back to your slide deck and show us that one of your earlier slides earliest slides about why startups fail yeah. I, think, I thought that was a fascinating slide and um one of the things that, and I wish I could put this slide with the compelling elements right next to this slide just to discuss it, but when I um, looked at that data, the, the second most common reason that startup companies fail is there is no market need, 35%, almost the same as running out of money, which you can understand. But given your presentation and sort of those top 12 factors that people need to put into a pitch deck, how does it, uh, how does that number uh, end up being so high? A, clearly they haven't gone through your program and haven't been mentored by <laughs> entrepreneurship at UBC, but why is that so high? I, I think it's a couple of things. I, I think the competitive landscape is super important. And I'll give you an example. So, 
Uh, we have a company in town, Zymeworks. They have developed a HER2 biparatopic antibody. Um, but in terms of the competitive landscape in breast cancer, the HER2 antibody that was approved originally, trastuzumab, went generic. Right, and so there are, or, or there's, you know, biological equivalent antibodies are about 20 or 30 on the market. So the sort of the, the differentiation that's required is quite significant. Um, and there's a number of different groups that have tried using that antibody with ADCs. Um, the landscape changes and there's, the, the, there's like, I think we looked at it once and there's like 35 antibody drug conjugates being developed against that specific target. So there's no way the market can support 35 of the same. Um, and so that's that's one thing. Um, there's also, I would say, I would say some of my digital health uh, groups have sort of identified that there is no interest in what they're providing in terms of people paying for it, right? So there's interest mm -hmm. in terms of like, oh, this would be great free, but they don't need it. So it's sort of a nice to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll fail because there's nobody willing to pay for it. Right. No paying customer. So my second question on this, uh, and it jumps from this slide, is uh, that 14% of the companies fail because they do not have the right team. So what does the right team look like from your experience? And maybe what does it look like at various stages of startup growth and scaling? Right. Um, I would say team is super important. So for example, in the beginning, in lab to launch program, what really works well is when you've got at least two people, um, if it's a PI and a postdoc or multiple postdocs and a PI, that tends to work really well. Um, engagement is super important. And as a venture transitions, it changes, right? So you're going to need a business person, you're going to need a regulatory person, you're going to need a drug development person. Um, and on the digital side, it's like developers, et cetera. Um, it's really important to look at, you know, if you can look, uh, give examples of companies in your space, what they look like, say, you know, five years after launch, but how big is the team? Um, who are the people? What are the key skill sets that you need? Um, there's been a lot of companies that fail quite early because they, they, they are unwilling or unable to get team members, which can sort of provide that, um, needed expertise in specific areas. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Thanks. So um, I'd be happy to squeeze in one more question. If anybody has a question, um, we have, I see somebody in the Q&A, uh, Nashmia Zia. So Nashmia asks, if the technology is targeted to provide cheap therapeutic, uh, provide a cheap therapeutic to third world countries, but is equivalent in therapeutic efficacy to the ones used in the USA or Canada, what would be the best pathway to get it to market when the USA Canadian market is not very interested in a cheaper product? Uh, excellent question. So this is something that we focus a lot on. And so at, at Entrepreneurship UBC, we have a sort of the human healthcare venture studio, but we also, also have the social venture studio. And one of the things we look at is how to get translate the things that we're developing, whether it's a technology, furniture, everything to, I guess, third world countries for lack of a better word. Um, and so the pathways can be quite quite different. Um, the I will say that the USA Canada market is always interested in a cheaper product if it delivers the same therapeutic efficacy. The question is whether you're gonna get the funding to, to prove that. Um, so there's different ways that you can uh, set up companies to, um, you know, work with groups like the Gates Foundation, et cetera, to get funding for uh, therapeutic trials in different countries. Um, I will say, depending on what you're developing, it's sometimes pretty difficult to uh, run clinical trials in, in different areas. Um, I'd say the, the more likely scenario is you run your, your trials in the U.S. and Canada and just offer your product uh, in a cheaper price point uh, to the different markets. Um, there's, if you're a big pharmaceutical company, you're worried about the product being re-imported to your big country and, and losing money. Um, but yeah, it's something we think about quite a bit. I'd have to know more about what specific area you're thinking about, but it's definitely, it's definitely an issue and challenge. And it's certainly 
beneficial to the people as a whole to try to get your product onto the market, depending on what it is. Um, but uh, it's something we think about quite a bit. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. And Jonathan, I cannot thank you enough for delivering an extremely informative and timely presentation today.